we we're so uh, in this society right now there's so much annual agriculture but there's this i think there's this movement or the sensitivity towards going back to perennial agriculture mm, 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 talk to me about the role of perennials in cropping systems over here or in agriculture let's let's back off back and perennials yeah. in agricultural systems i know Altieri talked about perennials and, and annuals mixed. Uh, so g g give us a little bit more of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I can give you a perspective from some of the things that we've seen on the soils. And, yep. and, and, and we've done work with a number of perennial grasses here, and then we've worked with alfalfa Got as it. well. And one thing that we've observed through our research is that you consistently see increases in soil carbon and nitrogen. Now, the, what's unique is that Sometimes that increase is near the surface, but sometimes, such as like with switchgrass, mm -hmm. those increases can be deeper in the soil profile. And okay. so that, that, that's really unique because then, you know, the, how the soil functions with the environment um, uh, is, is affected about where that carbon is, I guess, is being allocated yeah. by that particular perennial. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and unpack that for me, soil carbon, uh, you know, one of the things I've learned through this trip is that about 40% of the soil's, the, the plant's photosynthetic energy goes towards these carbon exudates in the soil. Yeah. So will you tell me, unpack a little bit what kind of carbon we're finding? Because in my mind, when I think of carbon, I often just think of the, the, the dying, the dead, and the very dead in the soil organic matter. But we've also got water extractable carbon in in the pore spaces and things like that would you would you unpack that a little bit more for me yeah well I can perhaps a little bit I know okay. on that on that the depth distribution issue yes. near surface is roots and riser deposits you could the majority of their roots are going to be near surface anyway okay. and then you also have a, a residue effect as well okay. as that decomposes right. and becomes well what we call particulate organic matter I guess small yes. bits of, of mm -hmm. residue that then can be occluded within aggregates and then just really becomes sequestered carbon, right, right, you know, right. at time. Um, you know, deeper down in the profile, it's it's roots as well with switchgrass, but you also have, as you pointed out, these these exudates, those rising deposits yeah. that contribute to that. They may be a, more of a, a labile tar type of carbon, yes. easily mineralizable by 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 microorganisms within the, within the rhizosphere. But um, you know, the thing is, is that is that carbon gets allocated lower in the profile. Yes it's less likely to turn up as CO2 back okay. into the atmosphere. Got it. Okay, yeah. all right, and that gets back to how soil is functioning with the environment um, in that, you know, if you're, if you're able to put that down deeper right. in the profile, there's a higher chance it's gonna stay there. Got it, yeah. got it. Because so. your disturbance is gonna be, especially with these farmers, it's gonna be fairly much on the first couple of inches right, or one right. or two inches, yeah. Near that surface, you know, where it's warmer, okay, yeah. where you have higher rates of mineralization okay. and so forth, yeah. Okay. yeah. yeah. But uh, before I forget, you know, I, th I think this goes back to the paradigm we have in our heads. Perhaps you and I might have grown up with this paradigm that, that soil is a medium to grow plants, um, which tends to to give it a, a, a kind of a sterile look. It's like a factory. You put your inputs in and take your outputs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't really pay attention to, it's just a sort of an inert matrix. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about is very much more a dynamic, a symbiotic interconnected system, right? I think, and I think, I think others have, have described it much better than I could, but yes. they, we, we look at soil more than what it can produce, but the, the larger ecosystem services it can provide. Okay. Because we know that it, it's important in filtering water. We know it's important in filtering or, or, or cycling nutrients. Okay, we know it's, well, you know, it's an incredible habitat. Yes. Right? You know, yes. and that is certainly you know, the, the cornerstone component of being, you know, biomass production, food, feed, and fiber, and so forth. But yes. there's all these other ecosystem services yes. that come into play, you know, filtering water cycling nutrients, providing a habitat yeah. for, for a wide diversity of, of organisms. Um, it's quantifying those ecosystem services and their contribution over time is, is really the, the, the big challenge. And how our, how our conservation practices 
contribute to those larger services because it's 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 um, it, it, our our agricultural lands are 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 benefiting or can be the detriment of right. you know those uh, yeah. practices that affect those all those different services. Right. Right. Well, talking about dynamic living ecosystems, uh, you know, Chris Horton. Uh, when when we were talking, it talked about you know we started with the forty year, forty years ago we had the no till revolution. Mm -hmm, now mm -hmm. we're going to uh, sort of diverse diverse cover crops, and he calls that uber no till. But I think we can call this uber uber no till when you start throwing animals into uh, that mix. Yeah, yeah. Unpack yeah. that a little bit more for me. Yeah, the the, the integrated crop livestock right. system. In our reductionist scientific approaches, often we miss, you know, we'll have the crop guys working on something and the livestock guys working on something. Have you done any work on livestock and cropping systems together? Mixing them together. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Well, it, it's something we've been looking at for about 15 years okay. now. Started something in 1999. And um, we were interested in a lot of different questions, you know, how well could cattle perform yes. on these systems, um, you know, uh, what was the crop production like? And also, how was the soil responding to, to, to being, you know, to having these crops grazed? Yeah. And, and the, the system that we used was a, a winter swath, uh, swath forages and then grazing them in swaths over the course of the winter. And so there's a lot of questions about having animals out on the ground in the fall, you know, and whether it's going to cause compaction and so on yep. and so forth. And, and what we found, we made measurements over nine years. Yes. And, um, and what we found is that really, the, and we were looking at residue treatments and, and frequency of cattle traffic and so yes. forth. And we, we found that for the most part, there's really no net negative effects on near surface properties. Yes. Now that 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 was not really a very sexy result. You know, you yep. set out your treatments, you hope to see differences. We yep. didn't see that. But w what the, the the real interesting work that we found that is that we did we did this integrative assessment of soil quality using um, it's called the Soil Management Assessment Framework. Yep. It's a it's a scoring system developed yep. by Susan Andrews. It's a wonderful tool to understand you know sort of a, a broader effects of, of uh, treatments on a range of soil properties. Mm -hmm. But what we found is that our, our, our SMAF scores, I'm using the acronym there, our SMAF scores for integrated system were not different from our perennial grass pasture, okay. which that's what we were holding up as sort of our ideal Standard. soil condition. Right, yeah. exactly. And so what we found is that, hey, this is great. We're able to maintain a condition we consider to be ideal. Okay. And, and that, that, was, uh, that was, I guess, a, a, a good news for soil. Significant well. finding. Yeah. Any grazing systems that you found particularly effective? Mm. Um, I, I've heard of mob grazing, and I know Ray Archuleta just loves mob grazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we haven't done research on okay. mob grazing here. Okay, just just yet. Okay. so I can't can't speak to that. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, I hope I find someone who who mob grazes. I know I've I've seen it in. I've seen it in effect not only um, on Gabe Brown's farm, but I've also seen someone in South Carolina who mob grazes chickens. Oh, mob grazes! Oh, <laughs> so fantastic! Chicken tractors, yeah, that's pretty cool. Oh, fantastic! And then they they use they use those uh, once the chicken tractors have gone, you know, they've got cows, goats, donkeys. Donkeys are their pasture ornaments, and they've even got pigs that then use the benefits of the, the grazing. So oh my gosh. anyway. That's great. <laughs> so <laughs> all right. Um, there's a lot of concern in uh, this whole idea of agriculture and, and, and climate change. Mm -hmm. Part of your work is about climate change. Mm -hmm. Talk to me a little bit about what you've been doing in that arena. Yeah. Well um been evaluating greenhouse gas balance and in grazing systems, in dryland cropping systems, and uh, uh, it's uh, you know quantifying the gas fluxes, not just when it's warm and convenient like now, but yeah. also doing it in the winter, which is really important because yeah. there are some gases that uh, that uh, are emitted during the winter time when temperature gets right close to to near zero. You know, you got to be out there and measure your nitrous oxide That's flux. Over uh, here, it's zero Kelvin, right? 
<laughs> can sometimes see like it. <laughs> yeah. But um, but it, it, it the the work that we've done here, I guess, contributes to 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 to. Um, a larger body of work yes. uh, across the country and really across the world and understanding how our different agricultural systems sort of, I guess, can uh, contribute or or mitigate, I guess, um, uh, anticip anticipated climate change. Yeah, okay. yeah. And, and so, you know, what we, you know, hope to be able to, to to use this information that's very site specific yes. in, a, in, a, in a broader context to be able to make some recommendations. Right. Now, we've learned um, enough to be able to, I guess, make a few generalizations because I mean, uh, climate change is one of those things where you know there's an adaptation component and there's also a mitigation component. Yes. And um, and some of the things that we've already been talking about kind of address both of those, and and that's being you know, improving your soil management yes. and increasing your crop diversity. Right. Okay, and 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 you know what those two things do is that you know if 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 the systems are applied appropriately to soil climate, you know, conditions in a particular locale, you can do both. You can you know increase your organic carbon, right? sequester that carbon yeah. okay that's a mitigating effect mm -hmm. you can also improve your nitrogen use efficiency yes. okay that is also that's a mitigating. big deal that's a big deal absolutely we appreciate that is that just because of the ghg effect of um, um, nitrous oxide when it comes up right okay. so you're, you're looking at something that's what about 300 times that in terms of you know uh, right. the heat trapping capacity the co2 so you really focus on that n2o yeah. and and keeping the nitrogen out of the atmosphere and either in the soil or in the plant or in the animal. Where it's right? supposed Where to it's be, supposed right? to be. Immobilized right. Right. until it's ready. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, that's, um, that's pretty cool. Tell me, what would farming, I mean, sounds like it, I looked at some um, sort of global balances and there's more carbon in soils than there is in the atmosphere mm -hmm. and the above ground forests together globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean for the potential of farming and even me and my own back garden? What does that mean for the potential if we were all to go ahead and apply these simple practices because they're actually simple rather than complex? What would that mean in terms of our global uh, carbon dioxide storage in the atmosphere? Mm. <laughs> that that's a complex question, Buzz, and one one that has. I, I need a single answer. I know you do, because <laughs> there's all these interacting factors. Right. I mean, yes, you can you can change your your management to sequester more carbon, yep. but then we have to overlay the effect of weather and warming temperatures yep. and the effect on mineralization. Right. What's so what's the net easy. balance? Yes. You know, I think the thing, what we have to think about is is if you. You apply management that moves us on the trajectory of increasing soil organic matter, which is so critical and such a foundational component. Because once you start increasing that, then you see all the benefits to biophysical components that, with enough time, is going to improve your production because yeah. of the available water right. capacity, larger microbial biomass, and so forth. Yeah. Okay, and it also is going to make your your soil. A bit more, I guess, resilient yes. to external stresses. Got it. Okay, so that comes back to now it's an adaptation yes. attribute because now you're 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 creating a soil environment that's that's going to provide you a little bit more resilience, a little more buffer to deal. Two with or those. three more days of moisture, which might make Ma the make all the difference. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So. That's 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 a pretty cool idea. Well, you know, looking at it, even if I didn't believe in global warming and greenhouse gases, if I'm a producer, I have a vested interest in increasing the carbon in my soil because that's where it's supposed to be. Yeah, and, and you have a vested interest in making sure the nitrogen that you're using is yeah. getting into your product, yeah. right? I mean, because right. that, 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 that's, that's money in the bank, yeah. you know, yeah. or money saved, I guess. Right, yeah. well, you've done some work, you, you mentioned it a little bit earlier on um, uh, about the assessment of soil health. You know. 
again, being a chemist and or chemical engineer with a nice chemical background, it's great to have, you know, so many ppm of this and so many ppm of I'm that. I'm with you. Yep. What's the work that uh, that you're doing in assessing soil health so that it might m be something that in the future farmers can use? Uh, this is going to be really disappointing, Buzz, because <laughs> it's almost social science is the way it is. The work I've done in the past yeah. with assessing soil health, yes. um, and I, I've looked at all kinds of different ways, from the standard laboratory tests to yeah. the soil quality test yeah. kit and, and right. other measurements. And what I've found is that the first thing you want to do when you're assessing soil health is talk to the farmer yeah. first. Because often they know what soils are good and bad. They yes. may not know why, but they right. know where they're at. And that, that, that might be your, your first iteration or you know, jumping off point for doing other assessments. In fact, the, the work that I did way back when for my PhD found that farmers, their perceptions of their soils, the, the, the attributes of their soils, were correct or nearly correct 75% of the time. Okay. You know? So, so that's so the social science aspect. It's the social, but, but it shows that, that you had, it was, it was a very important first iteration in understanding what's going on on a farm is, is just to talk to them. Yeah. You know? and, then, and then after that, then you can, you can strategize your assessment so that you do things that become increasingly more costly or time intensive yes. so that when you get to the end, then you're doing the ones that we're really comfortable with. Yeah. You know, the stuff in the lab that gets you the, the part per million yeah. of, of whatever. You know? yeah. Yeah. So, so that, that um, you know, that's one aspect. It, and this is really unscientific of me to suggest, but I think we need to dig a hole every now and again to sort of reorient our, ourselves and our senses to what's going on in the soil. I mean, you can appreciate this, you've seen others do it, because what you see, what you feel, what you smell And sometimes is, what you taste. And sometimes what you taste, be careful what you do with that, but right, <laughs> can tell you a tremendous about, yeah. about what's going on in the soil, and it could also guide what assessments you might want to follow up with. So anytime I go to the field, you, you bring that sharpshooter. You yep. dig a hole and you see what's going on. Well, as a matter of fact, you know, when I was out on uh, Dave Brandt's farm in Ohio, I have yes. a picture of him in his, uh, he had a gator, or, you know, one of these four wheelers, and he had his sharpshooter with him and he'd stop and he'd say, pick it up. So yeah, that seems to be, I guess a lot of soil health assessment is going to be very site specific. Yeah. And uh, those, the, 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 the innovators are the ones who are able to sort of assess that, I guess, based on their senses as well as what their crops are doing. Right, yeah. right. And, and, and also following it up with quantifiable indicators. I yep. mean, pulling sure. samples and sending them into the lab, Organic you got to have matter. that. Yeah. You bet, you yeah. bet, because it, that gives you the number you need to, to quantify a condition. And provided you can go back to the same spot a few years later, then, you know, methods are the same you can be able to look at, at yeah. where your what your trajectory is yeah. for your system yeah so, yeah yeah so. all right well you know um this is a question i guess when i started seeing this and hearing this i i don't yet understand the full history of the soil health movement but it seems like there were different epicenters one i would say was somewhere in the piedmont of north carolina mm -hmm. but i think Another epicenter of soil health was here in, in North Dakota. Uh, tell me about how that evolved and, and why the emphasis, well, I guess it was at extremes over here, but what is North Dakota's influence on the whole soil health movement? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think, I think there's a number of convergent influences yeah. that, that come into play, no, no single one being necessarily more important. Right. Um, but you know, first, you have to look to the farmers and ranchers yeah. in the region and, and their creativity yes. to be able to adapt these principles on their farms that, that makes sense for them. Yes. Um, certainly, you have to look to our conservation organizations, NRCS, our soil conservation districts, other conservation orga organizations in the state and the region that um, they very much have... Um, 
they've embraced the soil health principles in their message to, to producers um, and did that early on. You know, yeah. and we think back, what, late 80s, early 90s, you know, so yeah. off really, and then they were yeah. right on board with that. And then I think that our research institutions, you know, NDSU and ARS, I think we have perhaps a, a role to play in, in, in quantifying some of these changes, scientific, you know, and, and, and make, yeah, I guess providing the science to, to, to back up some of the observations that, that we've seen um, is, um, so, so it's, 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 it's a number of converging influences. When I, when I think to this lab, it's, you know, we've been here for over 100 years right. now. And, and if you, we've always been a lab that's been focused on natural resource Resources. issues. Right. And, you know, whether it was the tree wind breaks or grazing systems or cropping systems or mine, mine land reclamation research or climate change or integrated systems or what have you, the soil was sort of the common denominator in all of that. And, and so I, I think that, you know, at this lab, there's sort of a historical momentum that comes from four generations of previous science that contribute to some degree to things that are going on today, yeah. you know, and, and, and as for, you know, today and our staff, I think we, I, I think we're, we're, re we're unique in that we have skills that lend themselves well yeah. to understanding soil health in a scientific um, yeah. you know, perspective. And I, I think also that we're, we're willing to take what we know and find and translate it in a way that is, is understandable and seems to resonate with producers. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, that's pretty good because uh, it seems certainly what I saw in Burley County three years ago that uh, you've got You've got some producers that are on board with this. I mean, uh, yeah. I didn't see any of the, or I, I saw the conservation, the, you know, people like Jay Fuhrer facilitated, but it was the farmers, I think, who spoke to the other farmers. You know, the, the one instant where two farmers from North Carolina, before they got home, they had ordered their cover crop seed. <laughs> to me, that was a powerful message. Oh, absolutely. And so, you know, I, I just love being actually back back in, in this part of the world. Um, I, I've got a couple of other questions, sure, but we've, sure. we've, we've covered so much. Your advice to a farmer, um, I'm going to be, first of all, I'm going to say, you know, that's all, all very well in your part of the world, but you don't understand how my soils work. I've got to do this to them. I've got to turn them over all the time. <laughs> um, and, and all those principles of soil health don't really work in my area. Hmm. I'm recalcit recalcitrant now. Your advice to the farmer who might view this whole idea of soil health with, with a certain level of skepticism. Mm. Wow. Well, I, I think we have to look to the future and what what our future conditions might be like for, for production and and how Im important being adaptable to variable conditions is, is going to be. And and that adaptability, you know, um, I think that there's an inherent aspect of it that uh, comes from um, having a, a, a strong and resilient soil resource. And so with, with <sighs> explain strong and resilient for me. Yeah, so it's you know you're looking at 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 a soil that can buffer shocks. Yes. Okay, can deal with, with with droughts or extreme precipitation events, and still be able to, to continue to, to function. Yes. Okay, if 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 we're dealing with a you know a anticipated future that is going to be dealing with more extremes, why wouldn't you want to be begin managing in a way that is going to promote, I guess, a soil condition that's going to be able to better handle that? Okay. Yeah. And, and um, yeah, it, it's, 
it's a tough sell, Buzz, I know, because money really drives a, a lot of decisions in, in, in a lot of, a lot of, you know, it's, it's easy to think about your agricultural landscape as a, as a factory, you know, nice. the, the inputs and the soil is just there as a repository to be able to hold up the plants upright and get the nutrients to them and that's that. But, but um, soil does so much more than that. All the other services that are important and may not be important within the time span of a particular growing season, but will become clear over the period of a decade or more that if, if, if the management is, 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 I guess, working to, to create a, an improved resource, right. you're going to be able to, you're going to be able to, it's going to ex express itself through better functioning soil. Better so. functioning soil. So better yeah. functioning by supplying nutrients to the plant, supplying water to the plant. Yes. Those are the functions so. that farmers care about, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, keep, keeping the, the, the water where it lands, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So... Do you want to go out to the field at all? I'd or? love to go out to the okay. field. Well, um, let, let's just wrap it up. Uh, Mark Levick, uh, a research soil scientist here in Mandan, North Dakota. It's been fantastic talking to you. Uh, I, once again, a learning experience. This whole experience for me has been learning. But uh, I look forward to going out into the field and, and seeing what you've got to show us. All right, let's go dig a hole, right? Let's go dig a hole. Thank <laughs> all <right>. you. <laughs> all right.